Hello, I'm Gene Preuss. This video will look at the effects of the Mexican Revolution on immigration to the United States and the Mexican-American community as it moves in to World War I. In this lecture, we want to look at the causes of the Mexican Revolution, as well as evaluating the effects of the revolution on the Mexican-American community, and finally, assess the influence of the revolution on World War I. Let's review some of the information we covered in the last video was about Porfirio Diaz. He was a military hero. He had battled the French, uh, especially at the Battle of Puebla. Uh, he also ran unsuccessfully later on against Benito Juarez for presidency. And in 1876, Diaz seized power. His Porfiriato was marked by the phrase, order followed by progress. And he did bring political stability into the Mexican government. And he was influenced by a, a very popular idea called positivism and spiritism. This was spiritual progressivism. Uh, kind of social Darwinism it was popular in Europe, in France, as well as in Latin America. And this was what motivated Diaz in some of his uh, political appointments. He invited a lot of foreign investment, especially in the railroad and petroleum industries. And he also divided Indian land. This was the Ley Lerdo, and he sold the land to foreign investors. And this would give rise to a nationalistic cry, Mexico for Mexicans, among many who opposed Diaz and his policies. He did have a liberal land policy in that he was giving land and, and promising land to a lot of people, and this had the effect of driving many indigenous people from their land ownings and reducing them into debt peonage. So for Mexican laborers, uh, many were influenced at the time by American labor unions. As industrialization was coming into Mexico, so were labor unions. And they were fighting for better wages for the employees. There was also a lot of political radicalism. This gives rise to the growth of liberal parties. Uh, and one example of this is the Flores Mogón brothers, who end up uh, having to flee Mexico. They come into the United States. They settle for a while in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, other places as they are fleeing uh, opposition to them and threats against their lives. There's also native uh, Mexican, I say Native American, Native Mexican resistance, uh, and political opponents there include people like uh, Francisco Madero. Now, uh, uh, Madero was a political woman who was also wealthy, who was also a landowner. He was not uh, from uh, the Native American side, but he certainly identified with a lot of other people. And he, I mean, he and his family were friends with the Porfirio Diaz family. So this was an internal uh, political struggle. So, needless to say, uh, Diaz had made a lot of opponents. Now, for Madero, in, uh, he had been educated in France and the United States. Again, he comes from a wealthy family uh, who were friends with the Porfirio Diaz family. But he was provoked by an interview that uh, Porfirio Diaz did with an American journalist named Creelman. And in this Creelman interview. Uh, Diaz, I mean, I, I don't know if he didn't think that Mexicans would read this, but he kind of said he was ready to retire, ready to step down, that he was going to bring more democracy to Mexico. And Madero challenged him uh, to an election in 1910. There was some repression against this. Madero is arrested, but he flees, he escapes and flees to the United States. And in his plan of San Luis Potosí, he does call for a revolution in Mexico. Madero did lead troops to oppose Diaz's re-election, and now Diaz did promise reforms, but Madero called for him, you know, don't promise for reforms, resign. And so with the Treaty of Ciudad Juarez in May of 1911, Porfirio Diaz resigned and went into exile. Madero became the president, but he faced a lot of opposition and a lot of rebellions led by former uh, Porfirio Diaz supporters. 
And this is going to lead to increased immigration, people fleeing the revolution, people fleeing the unrest. And we talk about the revolution happening in the early 1900s, 1910s, but there was uh, upset and protest and violence going on in northern parts of Mexico much earlier, in the 1880s, as the railroads were moving in there. There was increased labor needs in the American Southwest, and so this was a push-pull factor. As more farmlands were being opened uh, up, especially in the New Mexico and Arizona territories, there was anti-Asian and anti-European immigration restrictions being passed in Congress, and so this uh, uh, affected these push-pull factors, drawing people into the United States, especially from South America and Mexico, but also the push factors, uh, the factors in Mexico that were leading many to leave. In American farms, uh, because of increased technology, there was more need for farming, more year-round need for farming. Uh, you did have the development of sugar beets, cotton, and vegetables in places like California, Colorado, and Texas that were driving the need for more migrant workers, more agricultural workers. And also, transportation had improved. So people were able to take advantage of railroads that were beginning to crisscross the United States, especially in the Southwest, and that were tying U.S. railroad terminals to Mexico. And certainly, by 1910, you also had better use of automobiles. There was increased immigration between the years of 1910 and 1920. Estimates of about 1 million Mexicans came into the United States, and they were not all peasants. There was a lot of social and economic diversity. There were elites. There were families. There were rural residents, certainly. And a lot of these people were pushed off the farms or uh, had their farms taken away from them as part of the Lelerdo uh, that was going on in Mexico, or as part of the uh, industrialization that was going on. And so the majority of the immigrants were agrarian workers or laborers or even farmers, but it was still a diverse pool of immigrants. In the United States, they also found changes in the land, but it also benefited them, and it required more of the migrant farm workers and the immigrant farm workers. There was commercial investment in land going on in the United States as well. Uh, more mechanization of agriculture. So, for example, you have dry land farming going on in the West. This means a lot of irrigation. Uh, but it also means that crops can grow more regularly year-round. And you had different types of cash crops being produced. Uh, for example, the sugar beet industry do m lots and lots of agricultural workers. The development of what's known as the big swing. And this was migrant workers could come into the South Texas region where the winter garden area was being developed uh, and uh, in spinach fields and uh, different types of uh, crops growing on in South Texas and then follow various crops uh, as the harvests and as the planting season changed throughout the year. Uh, and sometimes this would take migrant workers as far north as Minnesota, Chicago, and that area. And so you see the spread of Mexican immigrants across the United States. There was also violence as we move closer to 1916, as war begins in Europe, there is a question of will the United States get involved, will Latin American countries get involved, will Mexico get involved. And this mixed with the border violence that was going on as a result of the Mexican Revolution produced a conflagration of troubles going on along the border. For example, 1916, uh, some of Pancho Villa's forces raid Columbus, New Mexico, and kill some Americans in the United States. Now, there were also Americans being killed on Mexican railroads uh, a few years before that in Mexico, and also uh, petroleum workers who were being attacked. So there was violence happening, and people were afraid, and there was unrest. But even more so is as the war grew, and England was being drawn into the war, and they were asking for United States help. There were fears of a Mexican-German alliance that would possibly take land 
away from the United States. So two of these, in 1915, the plan of San Diego, a rider was stopped in South Texas, and uh, on him were found notes that uh, Germans were trying to instigate Native Americans, African Americans, and Mexican Americans to join together, uh, and in exchange they would get the land Mexico had lost during the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo back. This also is phrased in the much more famous Zimmerman telegram of 1917, where the German uh, minister uh, to Mexico uh, is informed by the German uh, foreign secretary that um, if Mexico will come in on the side of the Germans and attack the United States, that Mexico will get her land back. So you've got two incidents uh, both about this land that the United States has gotten from Mexico in 1848, possibly uh, being used as an incentive to attack America, that inflames um, mistrust along the border even more. And so you see a lot of attacks on Mexican Americans during the early part of the Mexican Revolution. The numbers are unclear. And many times these go unreported, but estimates of somewhere between 500 and 5,000 lynchings is believed to have occurred. One of the most vicious of these was the Povenir Massacre in 1918, where Texas Rangers attacked and killed uh, residents, the male residents of a town, small town, in South Texas. Uh, and so this causes an investigation by the Texas Senate, uh, led by Jose Canales. And the Canales investigation, uh, there are attempts uh, after this to uh, basically uh, undo the Texas Rangers. Uh, but what happens is the Rangers are reformed, uh, reorganized, with different restrictions placed on them. And uh, so there are some reforms that do take place as a result of the Canales investigation. When Texas finally does enter World War II, we do pass a Selective Service Act to draft members of the United States, uh, men, young men, into the military. And this is going to affect immigration because it's going to reduce it. Many of the immigrants are afraid that they will be the first ones drafted. Uh, and so there are also some literacy tests for immigrants, and there is an $8 fee that is attached if you want to come in and become a United States citizen. Uh, you have to pass these tests and pay your fee, and you can come into the United States. There are also fears among uh, agricultural industry that the labor lost to World War I as young men were going off to war, who was going to work in the fields, who was going to work in the factories. And so in the railroads, agriculture, construction, coal mines, they start exempting these employees from having to serve in the military. So... This is going to uh, uh, restart immigration. So between 1917, 1920, you've got about 50,000 people who do immigrate in. So it's, it's not as much as it had been, but you do, still do see immigrants coming in. And they are moving into places, not just in the Southwest, but across the United States. And so one of the things that you see as a result of the 1920s and the immigration, you're talking about uh, a population that has grown now to about 1.5 million Mexican and Mexican-Americans living in the United States are the development of colonias. And these are just poor neighborhoods where many of the immigrants are settling these colonies, Mexican colonies, uh, you know, for the English translation, uh, because they're settling where they can, where people speak the same language uh, and where they can uh basically in some way preserve their culture uh, rather simply because uh, they face a lot of discrimination. And the discrimination leads some middle and upper class Mexican and Mexican Americans to form mutual aid societies or mutualistas. And these organizations, which were not just for Mexican Americans, you see them in other ethnic communities as well in the late 1890s and early 1900s, were developed to give immigrants a sense of identity, a sense of culture and community, and a, a way of kind of preserving networks and communications that many had felt that they had left behind in the old country. But whenever they could find other people like themselves, uh, they tended to join together 
and help each other out. Uh, there was this idea that uh, the people who were middle class and upper class could help out the other poorer uh, or less affluent Mexican and Mexican Americans. And so one of these organizations that formed in Corpus Christi, Texas in 1929 was the League of United Latin American Citizens. And this forms as a, as a result of a combination of several other mutualistas that already existed, uh, some going back into the late 1800s, early 1900s. But the League of Latin American Citizens, League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, as it's called today, uh, still exists as one of the oldest of the Mexican-American civil rights organizations. For Mexican-American workers, as they uh, move past World War I into uh, the Great Depression, and the, 19, the 1920s and the Great Depression, you do see increased work, as your book points out, Industry and railroads become the major employers of Mexican-Americans. Uh, Mexican-Americans also use the strike beggars because they can pay them less. Uh, and many times uh, they're hiring Mexican-Americans over African-Americans. And Mexican-Americans and Mexicans also had the benefit of being non-unionized because the unions wouldn't accept them. There was also, as I mentioned earlier, increased restrictions on European immigrants following World War I. You have, in 1924, uh, the development of the Border Patrol to restrict immigration. You have the National Quota Acts uh, limiting the numbers of Europeans to come in. And this actually benefited uh, immigrants coming in from south of the border, uh, from South America, uh, and other parts of Latin America and Mexico as well, because they were not excluded. Uh, while Asians had been excluded for years, uh, you have in the 1880s, the Chinese Immigration Act of 1882, this is the first act aimed at a specific ethnic group. And then you have other immigration restrictions that go on throughout the 1920s. Also, the development of the Ku Klux Klan and other types of racial discrimination affected immigrants, and Mexican-American citizens alike. And so in this lecture, we looked at the causes of the Mexican Revolution. It was really kind of the actions of Ofiriato led to increased social and economic unrest. The changes that he was implementing fomented a lot of opposition. Evaluate the effects of the Mexican Revolution on the Mexican-American community. Well, it increased immigration and the growth of, of, of Mexican-American community, but it also helped preserve ties to Mexico because while the Mexican-American community at first was relatively small, the influx of immigrants, of new immigrants, during the Mexican Revolution re, uh, re-established some of these ties and made people really appreciate their homeland a little bit more. Uh, there was this uh, idea of a beautiful Mexico, Mexico Lindo campaign, which um, one of the presidents of Mexico tried to implement, uh, asking people to be proud of their heritage. And this worked. And we wanted to assess the influence of the Mexican Revolution on World War I, and we saw that increased border violence led to fears of uprising and reclaimed territory, or at least losing the territory that the United States had gained after the war with Mexico in 1848. Thank you very much for joining us on this video, and we hope to see you soon.